Whenever you see an adult who is having problems, you can trace it back for, to the first three to five years. You're about to hear a life-changing speech from Brian Tracy. Relax, take notes, and watch this entire video so you don't miss anything that can have a huge impact on your life. The starting points of the development of negative habit patterns are, first of all, destructive criticism. In early childhood, destructive criticism is more painful than a lash because destructive criticism, we used to talk about this like a neuron bomb. You know, a neuron bomb has a special characteristic that you set it off over a city and it kills all the inhabitants and it leaves all the buildings. So if you're in the serious business of warfare, looting, plunder, and things like that, you don't want to destroy all the property, so what you destroy is just destroy all the owners, and then your army goes in, buries all the bodies, and you keep all the buildings. I mean, that's what the neuron bomb was for. Neutron bomb, I'm sorry. Uh, they used to call Jack Welch Neutron Jack because he would shut down entire divisions and lay off 30, 40,000 people and leave all the buildings standing. Called him Neutron Jack. So destructive criticism is like a neutron bomb in that what happens is the neutron bomb destroys the person and leaves the building intact. Destructive criticism destroys the emotions of the person and leaves the person intact. So there's the person walking around with their emotions completely destroyed from destructive criticism. Destructive criticism early in life, as you know, leads to incredible feelings of failure and feelings of inadequacy. Now anything said by a PP, which is a prestigious person, parent, sibling, older relative, teacher, is taken to be a true representation of reality by the child. As an adult, if I were to say something to you, uh, like Randy, I'd say, boy, that's that shirt you're wearing sure sucks. I mean, what, would you get that at a Goodwill or something like that? Randy can just laugh. You know, when men say that, by the way, it's usually a sign of affection anyway, so it's pretty hard to get anybody mad. But, but Randy can just laugh, and he can take my opinion for what it's worth. And he can take it, he can, he can um, respond to it because he's an adult. And he's got enough discriminating power to consider the source, all right? Children don't have any ability to discriminate. So anything you say to the child, the child accepts as true. If you say, you know, you're no good, you're late, you never clean up your room, you're messy, you're not very smart, you'll never amount to anything, child has no way of blocking that. It goes straight into the subconscious mind and is locked in as a place of, of semi-permanent data. The child accepts it as true and operates on the basis of that. For example, you know, if I said to you, lunch is out here, down the hallway, and over there, you would just say, okay, you go out down here, down the hallway, to lunch. You don't question, you don't uh, argue, you don't fight and raise your hand and so on. The child's like that. The child just accepts. So uh, anything that is said by an older person, sometimes an older relative will come over, an uncle, an aunt, a mother-in-law. So you see read Ann Landers on a regular basis. The mother-in-law comes over and criticizes the children. And the mother says, to, so she says, you know, it's my husband's mother. What can I do? She's always criticizing my kids, and I think, don't think that's good. And, and Ann Landers is really clear. She says, you know, don't let her in your house. If you do, you supervise her, and you just tell her straight, don't talk to my children like that because it's so destructive. So number two is lack of love. As we've talked about, lack of love is uh, another form of neutron bomb, is there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of love a child receives, quantity and quality, and a healthy personality. One-to-one -one relationship. Now here is a mistake that many parents make. Many parents, say they love my kids, oh, I love my kids, I do anything for my kids. Of course, I'm at the office um, all week until 12 o'clock at night, and I play golf on the weekends and go off on business trips. And so what happens is they treat their children like domestic pets. When they come home, they may, if they're there, they may give them a little scratch behind the ears verbally. Hi, how you doing? Have a good day. Then they watch TV. And you'll find that the amount of one-on-one -on -one time that parents spend with their children, they get so busy that they don't do it, especially during the formative years. Mothers are much better at this than uh, fathers are, but then there's a lot of people that say, well, mothers should get right back into the workforce as fast as they can um, and uh, get someone to take care of the kids or put them in, in daycare. Now, whoever came up with that great idea is probably a parent, a, a, an adult of a really broken relationship, um, broken parenthood, because the more time you spend with a child, the more you tell them how valuable they are. If you don't spend any time with a child, the child internalizes my mommy, my daddy, never spends any time with me, it must be because I'm no good. It must be because I'm fundamentally flawed. I'm just no good. And they grow up and they become a behavior problem and they get into trouble at school and they act out and they drink and they blow up in anger and they get, do damage to themselves. They are fighting against this awful feeling they have inside of being uh, of no value to their parents because their parents, especially their fathers, spent more, no time with them. 
This is a major problem in America where you have children growing up illegitimately. Is the William, Charles, George Will had this wonderful column many years ago, and I thought, what a wonderful thought. They said, no child asks to be born. No child asks to be born. So when a child is born, then you are responsible for taking care of that child. And then the second quote that I read was, a child should be in the company of someone who is crazy about them for the first three to five years of their life. And I thought, isn't that a wonderful idea? Is no child asked to be born, but by gum, if they're born, they should be in the company of someone who's crazy about them for the first three to five years of their life. And many parents didn't know this. We didn't know that. My parents didn't know it when I was growing up. We sure knew it when we had our first ch children because we had learned, we, we had caught up. For children to feel fully loved, three conditions must exist. Number one, the parents must love themselves. Low self-esteem parents raise low self-esteem children because they don't love themselves. So they're critical toward themselves, they're negative, they're angry, they're depressed, they have a whole lot of problems, sometimes they drink and so on. Um, and many of us were raised by parents who didn't love themselves very much. And second of all, parents must love each other. The greatest kindness that a man can do for his children is to love their mother, and vice versa. The greatest kindness a woman can do for their children is to love their father. Because children learn about love by seeing it in their environment, by watching it experience. They learn. Many people get married. They call it a, a trial marriage. Most trial marriages are people have never seen true love expressed genuinely between their mother and father while they were growing up. So they have to get married to learn about it. And it's a trial marriage. It lasts a few years, breaks up in flames, usually in the 20s, mid-20s. And then they go on and now they have an idea what it's like to be in a marriage with uh, another adult. And often the second marriage takes. The statistic was out the day before yesterday was 50% of first marriages now end in divorce. I don't know if that's entirely true, but it may be because an uh, enormous number of marriages are trial marriages because they've never seen love in their environment and they have to go through trial and error to figure it out. The third factor is that parents must love the child. And there's only one way you can love the child. It's by spending an enormous amount of time with the child. There's only one way. You've got to really, really spend enough time so you really get to know the child and ask questions and listen and talk and go to movies and all kinds of things like that so that you really develop a, a deep down feeling of love for this child. And if you don't put in the time, nothing happens. The rule is this, a relationship only grows in value to the degree to which you invest more time in it. If you want your, any relationship at all, even a business relationship, a customer relationship, a relationship with a coworker or your boss, but especially with a member of the opposite sex, your spouse, your mate, or your child, you have to invest more time in it. That has to become a priority, is to spend more time in it. I had this discussion with somebody the other day. It was really interesting. I said that, you know, with love, they talk about quality of time, but quality of time is a function of quantity of time. Is you only get the quality moments, those unbidden, unexpected, moments in a relationship with another person as a result of providing large quantity. And the moments come unbidden. The moments come without anticipation. The moments come as a complete surprise. The moments just happen. There was that moment. And you remember it forever. Some of you remember it for years, but you've got to provide large quantities of time for that to take place. Um, so they must love the child. And many parents meant to love their child, and they even say, I love my child. I just never spend any time with them. I have no idea uh, what they're doing or thinking. A friend of mine who was, <laughs> you know, was talking about these things, about how important it is to be a good father, he, his daughter was going on a ski trip, and it was about five hours away, and she missed the bus. And so he had to drive her to the ski trip. And so uh, the bus left at 7 o'clock, and she overslept. So he had to drive her to the ski trip, so he drove to the ski trip, and they're going through mountains. This is in Utah. I still remember this. They couldn't pick up any radio. So there was no radio on, so they talked for five hours. And she was 16 years old. She said he learned more about his daughter in five hours than he learned in 16 years. He had no idea who she was, what she thought about, what her concerns were, what her fears, her ambitions, her desires, her goals. And he thought he was just a great parent. He was just shocked. I mean, he never got over the shock. And from then on, he always drove his daughter to ski. He always created that five-hour block to drive her to the mountains for skiing and never had the radio on. One of my rules is never travel with someone in your life with any music on. Leave it off. Leave it off so that um, you can just talk.
Because if you create a vacuum of silence by not having it on, it'll fill with conversation. If you, as soon as you turn it on, all conversation stops, shuts down completely. So just a very small thing. Barbara and I travel all the time and we never have anything on. We will never listen to anything. We just talk. Actually, I just listen. Um, <laughs> the only, <laughs> which nobody believes, all right. Uh, the only way you can really love a child is by spending a high quantity of time with the child. And this has to take precedence over all things. They did a study of 50 parents on, I believe it was Mother's Day, I think it was Mother's Day, and, or Father's Day, maybe it was probably Father's Day. But they asked them, what's the biggest regret that you have with regard to your grown children? And 49 out of 50 had the same regret. Can you guess what it was? I wish I had spent more time with them when they were young. I wish I had spent more time with them when they were young because if you miss that time, you can never get it back. You can never go back, you can't make it up. You can't go back and catch up on those years. So all with 49 out of 50 said their biggest regret as parents is I did not spend enough time with my children when they were young. So when Barbara and I heard that before we had Christina, our first child, and we made a vow that that would never be the case with our children, that we would spend enough time with them. So releasing your brakes, one of the, if one of the three above conditions existed, in combination with destructive criticism, you will have grown up with guilt. And guilt is the feeling of not being worth very much. Guilt is the most powerful and biggest negative phenomena in our society today. We have a plague like an epidemic of guilt that is pulling our society down and destroying the hopes of so many people. And guilt is an insidious, it's like a low-grade emotional infection that sits in there and that fouls up everything that we try to do, say, be in life. So, when we don't feel that we are worth very much, we feel worth less. And the greatest problem, a feeling of guilt, leads to a feeling of worthlessness. Interesting, I've spoken with the doctors who work with AIDS patients when AIDS was much more of an epidemic. They say the one characteristic of an AIDS victim was an overwhelming feeling of worthlessness. They felt absolutely worthless, and as a result, they engaged in promiscuous behavior that led to them getting AIDS. And it's because they just felt so worthless, they just punished their bodies because they felt so worthless for a whole variety of reasons. Um, the feelings of guilt and worthlessness are expressed in the thought or attitude of, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And this is one of the greatest single problems we have as adults. We look at others who are doing better and we think they're better than us, I'm not good enough. We think we want to start our own business and we say I'm not good enough. We want to start, we want to start our own practice. We want to do something new and different. We want to run a marathon. And the first thing that axes us, it cancels the thought is, wait a minute, you're not good enough. Hey, when I started off, I didn't graduate from high school. It took me a decade to get over this feeling of I wasn't good enough. And even if you work hard and succeed and do well, you feel like an imposter. It's called the imposter syndrome. You feel guilty. You feel they're, gonna, they're going to find you out because you're successful. It really, it's, they don't know. Way down inside, you're really not that good. They are going to find out. People who've been raised with feelings of guilt have this feeling that somehow they're going to lose it all and be put back to the beginning again. They're always in danger of losing everything. No matter what they've achieved, they have this uneasy feeling that it's all going to be taken away. I don't know if anybody here can identify with that. Uh, now, those who have been raised with destructive criticism and lack of love experience self-hatred and self-doubt. Whenever you see an adult who is having problems, you can trace it back for, to the first three to five years. Whenever you see an adult who engages in destructive behaviors, either for themselves or others, you can trace it back for the, for, to the first three to five years. And, um, and that's why it's so important that we get rid of the feelings of guilt. So we find that guilt is used for two reasons. Number one is punishment. Parents are, use guilt because guilt was used on them and it was used on their parents. And throughout the ages, there has been what, what I call negative religion. Negative religion is based on guilt. You must inculcate in the child a feeling of being guilty uh, before the age of six or seven or you'll never get them. They've got to feel awful. They've got to feel like sinners. They've got to feel like they are bad like they came into the world as a sinner and are bad. I have a friend who was an evangelical missionary in uh, Mexico. And I asked him, I said, how do you 
go about evangelizing in Mexico. He said, well, we pull in, we get a, 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 donor, a supporter, um, a sponsor who translates, and we pull into the center of a small town, and we say we're going to have a meeting, and we call people around this truck that's got speakers on it. He said, and then my job is to convince them that they are evil and sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God and are going to hell for eternal punishment. We've got to get them to accept that or they won't be open to the evangelical message. That's the opening line. I think, oh. And so you find negative religion is based on beating the emotional crap out of the child. So they raise, are raised feeling guilty and unworthy and undeserving. And if you can't do that, you can't get them later in life, because later in life they say, this is BS. You try to, you, I try to say, you're an evil person and you're going to hell. You'd say, hey, yeah, go stuff it where the sun can't, don't shine, you know. So what we did, with we raised, we raised our children with no, with no religion. We told them, God loves you and we love you. And they say, well, I don't love God. I don't believe in God. And they say, no, God believes in you, so it's okay. Do what you want. So our children have grown up with no religion. And you know what? They've grown up to be wonderful young people with high values and great characters and everything else, but we've never imposed a religion on them because we know how dangerous it can be. So it's guilt is used as punishment, and parents use it as punishment as well. They say, how could you dare do that? And I was expecting you to do this, and you said you would do that, and I was hoping you would do this, and wah, wah, and they just work you and work you, and they start it at a very early age because you've got to get the guilt hooks in the young, or, or adults will just laugh at it. So second of all is the control. And they use guilt to control you. Many people are controlled by guilt by long distance. The mother can call you up and say, oh, I was expecting you to call. Why didn't you call? You were going to call. I haven't seen you. Why don't you visit? And they can, they can use guilt at long distance. They can put those hooks in over 500 miles. So mostly mothers are brilliant at this, but fathers as well. Um, so, and, and because they learned it, and, and the reason they use it for punishment and control is because it's easy. You can do it sitting down. You can do it from a couch. You don't have to get up. You don't have to hit the kid with a stick. You can just use guilt and just and grab them from the inside and pull them. I've met so many adults who are still feeling guilty because of what their parents do or did to them, and their parents are still working them, still working them. So, the adult manifestations of guilt. See if these, any of these apply to you. Number one, feelings of inferiority, Feelings of inadequacy, feelings of undeservingness. There's a school of thought that says that the feeling of undeservingness lies at the root of all negative emotions. Well, there's many things, but the feeling of undeserving, being undeserving of good things, being undeserving of, of, of being really happy. That's why if you're really happy for a time and you've been raised with feelings of guilt, you'll feel, oh my God, it's going to be taken away. Something's going to happen because I don't deserve to be happy all the time. Well, the fact of the matter is you deserve all the happiness that you can legitimately enjoy by doing something worthwhile in the world, by treating other people well and by making a contribution. People say, well, I feel I don't deserve. They, say, they call this fear of success. It's not fear of success. It's a desire. It's a, it's, a, it's a feeling of undeservingness. When you tell people you're entitled to all the money you can earn if you do it by legitimately helping other people and making a profit. And they say, really? I said, you deserve it all. You deserve the house on the hill and the big car and everything else if you earn your money because the word deserve comes from the Romans de de servus, which is from service. If you earn your money from service, you deserve everything you can possibly make. I've had many people walk out and transform their financial lives with that one concept. And now their whole focus is not on the feelings of guilt, but their focus is on serving other people higher, better, inexpensively, more convenient, and so on. Number two, destructive self-criticism. People who have been raised with a feeling of guilt are always running themselves down. Oh, I'm always late. I never do this. I always forget. Uh, I'm terrible with money. I can't remember anything. Is they're always saying negative things to themselves. And what that does is it keeps the parental destructive criticism, keeps it going, keeps the plate spinning as adults. Number three, they're easily manipulated by guilt. You can be manipulated by, by strangers. Here's an example of the way they're taught in flight school. The flight attendants, they come by, and instead of saying, would you like another glass of water or Coke, they say, will that be all? Will that be all? Uh, or is there anything else? And they say it in, with just a little bit of an edge, like it would be a real inconvenience for me to bring you something. <laughs> and, so, and, and what they'll do is they say, oh, no, no, I'm fine. I don't mind sitting here for the next three hours with nothing to drink while my whole head implodes from... Uh, 
uh, uh, lack of uh, moisture. So what you do is you realize people are trying to use guilt on you, and they use it in restaurants. They use it in aircraft. They use it everywhere. And just don't allow them to do it. That person is a drive -by, victim of a drive-by guilt shooting. They were taught to use guilt by their mother. And now they just pass it on. And cause, Why? Because it works. They get really good bang. They don't have to serve you anymore. Because you said, no, I'm fine. I don't need any more. <laughs> yeah. Number four is they use guilt and blame generously. Remember, the evil that's done to the children is done onto uh, their children. So they use guilt and blame all the time. They're always blaming their other people. You did this, and you did that, and why did you do this, and how did you do that, and so on. I'll give you an example. My kids come home, and they get a lousy grade. I never get angry for them for lousy grades. They go off to college, and they get lousy grades, and they don't even send them home. Imagine that. They're even getting the grades. Um, and so what, what happens is that they use the they blame on other people, and it works. And we, we start to, we just keep it going, generation after generation. And you can tell, if a person has been raised with guilt, it was the mother that was raised with guilt, and the grandmother that was raised with guilt, and the great-grandmother that was raised with guilt. And why? Because it works. And the fifth is they use victim language. Now, the victim language is, I can't. I can't. I'm too weak. I'm too little. I'm too small. I don't have the ability. Other victim language, one of the worst of all is, I'll try. I'll try. I'll try. I'm trying. I'm trying. A friend of mine uses this example. He takes a person and he puts a pen on the, down on the uh, stage. And he said, here, he said, and he takes and grabs a hold of his back of his shirt and belt. He said, pick up that pen for me. And so the person goes to pick it over and he pulls. He says, pick up the pen. And he goes and pulls again. He said, pick up the pen. This is in front of the whole audience. And he said, go, 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 I'm trying. I'm trying to figure it out. You're holding it back. He said, great. He said, come on. Thank you very much. Sends it back to his seat. He said, see, the fact is, you're either picking up the pen or you're not. There is no trying. It's like Yoda. No try. Do or no do, but no try. So eliminate the words, I can't. Eliminate the words, I have to. Eliminate the words, uh, I'm trying, or I'll try, or I'll do my best. Have you ever invited somebody to a party and they said, I'll try to get there? What does that mean? It means I am not coming. I'm trying to signal you in a nice way. I'll do my best to get there. I'll try. I'll do my best. Winston Churchill had this great line when he'd given a command during World War II and the general said, mm, Mr. Prime Minister, I'll do my best. And he said, stop. Stop here. Just a second, he said. It is not sufficient that you do your best, but that you do what the situation requires and that you do it with dispatch. I don't want to hear about doing your best. I want to hear that the job will be done. Because when a person says, I'll do my best, they're kicking the back door open for failure. I'll try. It's kicking the back door open for failure. So don't use victim language and don't allow people to use victim language. Say, I will or I won't. I would like to, but I'm not going to. I decided not to. Thank you very much. I'm not going to. Could you do this? Could you do that? No, I would like to, but I don't have the time. And just tell them straight. Whew. Okay, so to rid yourself of guilt, here are the keys. Number one, eliminate destructive self-criticism. From now on, never say anything about yourself that you do not sincerely desire to be true. If you don't want to be, it to be true, because the reason that you're late is because you've decided not to be on time. That's all. I can guarantee that you would be on time for every appointment. What if they got, you've got $10,000 for every appointment that you show up five minutes early for, or 10 minutes early for. You'd be on time for every appointment for the rest of your life. In other words, if you decided to be there, you'd be on time. The reason you're late is because you have not decided to be on time. That's all. Cher was once accused. She arrived at a meeting, and the person said, you're almost late. She said, where I come from in Hollywood, that's called being on time. I thought that was funny. All right. Anyway. <laughs> all right. Number two, refuse to be manipulated by guilt. When a person tries to manipulate you using guilt, you say, excuse me, are you trying to make me feel guilty? And you smile at them. And nobody will admit it. They'll all lie through their teeth. And they'll say, oh, no, no, not at all. You say, that's good, because I thought you were trying to make me feel guilty. And when they try it again, mother, say it again. Are you trying to make me feel guilty? And just say it with a cheerful voice. And the third time you say, are you trying to make me feel guilty? They'll finally burst out. They say, yes, I am. You say, well, it's not going to work anymore because I don't feel guilty and I'm not going to do anything if you try to make me feel guilty. 
And if you keep trying to make me feel guilty, I just won't talk to you anymore. But, 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 but. And what that does is it forces them to start to engage in adult behaviors, in adult conversation. You have to break people of the habit of manipulating you with the use of guilt. So you just say, excuse me, I'm just curious. Are you trying to make me feel guilty? You're not attacking them. You're just saying this. And if, when they finally admit yes, you say, well, it's not going to work anymore. It's not going to work. I'm not going to do anything because I feel guilty. So what else you got? But that's all I got. I've been working for years. Number three, refuse to use guilt and blame on others. Refuse to use guilt and blame on others. Guilt is often a punishment. My mother was raised Catholic, so I say I come by my feelings of guilt and unworthiness, honestly. Uh, but my mother would take something, a mistake I made when I was five, and she'd still be reminding me of it when I was 15. One of the rules we have in our house is if somebody breaks a dish or makes a mistake, it's never mentioned again. It is never mentioned again. We never bring up a past mistake. We say that when you're growing up, you make mistakes, and life goes on, and we never mention it again. We never get angry, we never blame, we never remind. It's just a past event. It's like something that happened in a previous town. And it's never brought up again. Because by only by, by reminding you of a mistake you made, are you made to feel guilty over and over again. Now the fourth is to use the law of forgiveness. And this is perhaps the most important thing that I can share with you, because this is what changes people's lives. The law of forgiveness says that you are mentally healthy to the degree to which you can forgive and forget the grievances against you. In the Bible, in the New Testament, it said the principle of forgiveness, if a person hurts you, go with him 70 times 7. If you remember that you've hurt somebody, go and apologize to them. The principle of forgiveness right up to the end of the life of Jesus is the fundamental principle of Christianity. The ability to freely forgive is the mark of the truly developed, the superior human being. And that's why when you think of what they call the great mystics or the great lovers throughout history, they have been people totally without rancor or anger toward anyone, even people who put them to death. The ability to forgive is really the mark of how far you've come as a human being. So we say the people that you must forgive are, first of all, you must forgive your parents. Children grow up with ideas of, what, of things that their parents should or should not do. And those ideas may be based on reality or falsehood. It may be based on something someone said. When our daughter Christina was growing up, she was thinking of becoming a psychologist, so she visited a psychologist. And the first thing the psychologist told her was that she had terrible parents. Because we asked Christina twice in her lifetime to babysit for Catherine. Just take care of her while mom went shopping. And the psychologist told her, and when she was a very impressionable age, that that was an awful thing for her parents to impose on her to ask her to babysit for her baby sister, which was at home while mom went shopping. And she thought, wow, she didn't realize how badly she'd been treated. It, it, took, her, it took her years to recover from that. She took her years to get over this first impression. Remember a prestigious person giving a piece of input to a, a vulnerable person? And, this, and it turned out this psychologist turned out to be a bit of a wacko. And eventually, nobody would, nobody would send anybody to her. She was a teenager psychologist. But she would plant these sort of things in other kids' minds and turn their kids against their parents and raise their kids feeling that their parents had abused them because they'd asked them to wash their dishes or clean up their bedroom and children should be free and not have to clean up their bedrooms. And, I mean, it was just, anyway. My point was, the first people you have to forgive are your parents. And you have to forgive them for everything that they ever did that you still feel angry or unhappy about. And the way that you do it is one of three ways. You can just say to yourself, I forgive them completely for everything, and I let it go. I forgive them completely for everything, and I let it go. And whenever you think of them, you say, I forgive them completely for everything, and I let them go. What I did to clear my mental decks is I forgive them completely for everything, uh, I wish them well, and God bless them. I forgive them for everything, I wish them well, and God bless them. And I did this before my parents died, which is a good thing because often people are still angry with parents who've passed away and there's no ability to settle. But you can just say it to yourself. Just say, I forgive them completely for everything. I had one gentleman in my seminar who was still, he's 35 years old, still angry about something his father had done uh, or said when he was 15. And he decided, because he was still making him mad, because he realized it in the seminar. So he decided he'd go over that night and tell his father, who was a working guy, rough, gruff, you know, never showed any affection at all. So he went over, and he went over to his father's house. It was a Saturday after the 
seminar, and he said, Dad, I just want you to know uh, that I forgive you for that thing you did when I was 15 years old. And he said, I don't know what the F you're talking about. I never did anything that requires forgiveness. I have no idea what you're talking about. And he suddenly realized he had been mad for 20 years, and his father never even knew he did it. What a stupid waste of time, life, and emotion. He said, okay, Dad, no problem. And he left, and he was free at last. And he was just completely free. In most cases, your parents never even knew what they did. Your parents only did to you what they knew how. Some people complain my father and my mother didn't love me enough. But why do you think that was? It's because they, didn't have, they weren't loved when they were children, and they didn't have enough love for themselves to give any away. And so the rule is your parents gave you all the love they had. They had no more. It wasn't as if you did something that caused them to withhold it. They had no more to give you than they gave you. Is they gave you all they have. And so therefore you can't be mad at them any more than you could be mad at a person who's in a wheelchair because they don't get up and run. Sometimes people are emotionally crippled and all you can see is from the results. So what you do is you say, God bless them, I wish them well, and you forgive them. Sometimes you can go and see them personally. We have found in many cases that parents feel extremely guilty about all the mistakes they made with their kids. And so they're hoping against hope that their children will come and sit down and say, I forgive you and I love you. I spoke to a gentleman a couple of days ago, very interesting guy, very interesting guy, very successful. He said he never had any truck with his father. His father was gruff, difficult, abusive, angry. His father was on his deathbed when he was 32 years old, and he went to visit him on his deathbed and say, Dad, I forgive you, and I love you. He says, I love you too, son, and he died the next day. That's the only conversation he had with him in 20 years. Never seen him, never spoken to him, never had a conversation. But he says, thank God he did it before his father died so he could make peace. One of the most important things you can do is tell your parents that you forgive them for everything and you love them and you wish them well. And it's absolutely amazing. From that point on, you become an emotional adult. From that point on, you move from being a child with this big evil parent looming over you, you move up to emotional maturity. You jump over the canyon and from then on, you'll have the best years of your life with your parents. When I went through this with my parents in my late 20s, from then on, we were like friends, and we had just a great relationship for the rest of our lives, which was another 10, 15 years, because you let it all go. As long as the baggage is there, you still remain a child to your parent. The, child is still, the, the parent is still the rigid disciplinarian lording it over you with the emotional stick. As soon as you forgive them, you're free, and you become an emotional adult yourself. Our country is filled with people who are emotional children, emotional cripples, because they cannot forgive their parents. They're still angry with their parents. I was in, doing a seminar in Orlando, and this gentleman came to lunch with him. He said he had to get divorced from his wife after about 10, 15 years. And his wife was about 35 years old. And he had to still meet with her because they had two children, and they had children, things to straighten out. And he said he had had lunch with her the, night, the week before, and he, she started off complaining about her mother and complaining about her mother, complaining about her mother. And he'd heard this so many times. He had to, they got divorced about three years ago because he just couldn't take the negativity anymore. And he said to her, he said, Harriet, he said, do you realize that you haven't lived with your mother for 18 years? Yes, but my mother did this and my mother. You haven't lived with her for 18 years. How many years more are you going to be mad about something that your mother did or didn't do when you were a teenager? Oh, yes, but my mother, this and my mother. She, she was just like, in the, just caught up with it, almost like uh, rain man. <laughs> you know? She could not let go of the fact that her mother did something that hurt her feelings when she was young. I read the story of a woman who, uh, when she was a teenager, she put on 20 or 30 pounds, and she came home one day, and her father said, boy, you're sure looking porky. She was 35 years old and still an emotional basket case, still in counseling because she had not recovered from her father saying, geez, you sure look porky. One comment, one time, when she was a teenager, and she was porky, uh, and she still couldn't get over it. And she was still, she said, she is still emotionally conflicted because she can't get over that comment from her father, which is one other way of saying, be careful of what you say to your children because it can have a real negative effect on them. But look at the child. Why do not get the child? Let it go. Okay. So we forgive your parents. Second of all, forgive everyone else. Everyone else in your world who has ever hurt you for any reason. 
And people say, well, I can't do that because of what they've done and because of what they hurt and they hurt me and because of the cruelty and the years and the upset I had and so on. But remember this, forgiveness is perfectly selfish. As Emmett Fox says, every prisoner needs a jailer. Every prisoner needs a jailer. If there's no jailer, there's no, no prisoner. And so what happens is when you keep the person in prison, you remain the jailer. If you don't forgive them, you remain caught. Almost like, there's a ch like those chains and, uh, uh, and leg links that prisoners used to be on the, ch on the chain gangs. They used to be linked together. You're linked to the person by the chain if you don't forgive them. So the reason you forgive another person is to be free, is to liberate yourself. You don't care if the other person drops off a cliff. Now, that, now in time, you will be completely neutral with what happens to the other person, but you let it go completely. You just let it go. And you forgive them so you can be free. People say, well, I can't forgive that person. It's a perfectly selfish act. It has nothing to do with the person. As a matter of fact, if the other person knew that you were still upset about something that happened, they'd probably be happy about it. Now, would you like to go around ruining your own life and making that other person happy? You probably want to kill that other person, and you're thinking, well, I'm going to hurt them by destroying my emotional life on a day-by-day -day basis. Does this sound a little absurd, by the way? You know, I'm going to hurt them by punching myself in the face over and over. I'm just keep punching myself in the face until I bleed, and that'll get that person back in Cincinnati. That'll really punish them. You'd say, well, that's absurd. Imagine you took a hammer and say, that person at Cincinnati that I was married to, and whacked your hand with a hammer until it bled and the bones were broken. I mean, are, are you with me so far? This is absurd. And you know something? Physical pain you can take away with pills, but the emotional pain that you carry around with you is there all the time. So your job is to get free. And the way you get free is to just forgive everybody. You forgive people in your past. You forgive past relationships, past business deals. You just clean the deck. Clean the deck. Because it's the mark of the superior person is they have no anger. They have no hatred. There's nobody that they're mad at. No matter what anybody else has done, that's their problem. It's not your problem. Third, whoops, the third person you is yourself. And you forgive yourself for every wicked, senseless, brainless, stupid, unkind, cruel, and ignorant thing that you've ever done. Now, all of us have done countless things in our lives that we feel badly about. And it's time to let it go. In fact, Emmett Fox says that clinging to negative experience in your past is actually a form of weakness. It's a form of emotional insincerity. It's a refusal to grow up and get on with your life. It's not a mark of being a superior person and feeling guilty because you made mistakes. It's just a form of weakness that keeps you away from reality. Because when you let everything go, you said, okay, I'm not perfect. And remember this, the person who made those mistakes in the past is not the person that you are today. In the past, that person made those mistakes. That was the person you were at that level of knowledge and maturity. You are not now that person today. The person you are today would never do the silly things you did in the past. Isn't that true? So therefore, don't beat yourself up today for, the person, for a person that existed years ago. Because that was then and this is now. What you do is you say, that's not the kind of thing I would ever do now. And the wonderful thing is they say that wisdom comes from making mistakes. And, mis and, and, you, and you make mistakes in order to gain wisdom. And so what you do is you make mistakes in life. And the only thing you do with a past experience is what? Now you learn from it. You say, what can I learn from that past experience? And then you take the wheat and you let the chafe go. So whenever you think of a negative experience, you say, all right, what did I learn from that that's made me a better person today? And I always think on paper. I write down all the things I can think of. And you think, well, I learned to do more of this and less of that and not to do this and not to say that or think before I speak and to uh, do more due diligence. Due diligence has been my favorite word during the economic bust. Due diligence. I wish I'd done more due diligence into the background of people that I was doing business with. But I didn't, and life goes on. You know, the money's gone, life goes on. So what you have to do is you say, okay, I learned to do due diligence and do lots of research, and let it go. Let it go. Remember, we never become upset about a past event because you can't change a past event. Imagine a guy comes up to me in a seminar, and I said, how are you doing? He said, oh, I'm doing fine. I said, uh, you seem a little bit perturbed. Yeah, I said, I'm really pissed off. You're really pissed off. He said, yeah, I'm just furious. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, about five years ago, my wife, my family, and I decided to go on a picnic on Sunday, and we packed up everything on Saturday night. We we're going to leave first thing Monday morning, about a two-hour drive, and go on a picnic. And we got up on Sunday morning. It was raining. It rained all day. And we couldn't go on the picnic. And I'm still pissed. <laughs> You'd say, ooh, bring in the guys with the white coats. I mean, you're still mad 
about the fact that it rained five years ago and you couldn't go on your picnic? You're still upset? Yeah, I'm still pissed. You think, this person needs a checkup from the neck up. They're obviously a serious problem. What's the point that I'm making? There are people that are still mad about things that happened five years ago that you can't change. They've, they've gone forever. They, they've disappeared into the past, and they're still mad today for the mistakes they made or mistakes somebody else made. So what you do is you say, God bless them, I wish them well. Is I forgive them completely for everything, God bless them, I wish them well. And if you've done something to hurt someone else, go and apologize. Have the courage and the character to go to that person, write them a letter, make a phone call, send them an email, and just say, you know, what I did was really unkind and cruel, and I'm sorry, and I apologize. And then let it go. They say, what about the other person? What the, you're, you're not concerned about what the other person does or says or anything else. Just let them go. Many of us will feel guilty for years because we did something that we feel bad about. We did something that was unkind or cruel or something, uh, and we feel badly about it, but it takes tremendous courage to go and say, you know, I thought about that, and in retrospect, I'm sorry I said or did that. I'm sorry about what happened. And if necessary, make, make, make recompense. If necessary, make compensation. It's really, really important. In, in the Bible, what is the, what is the word that they use is to, um, uh, to repent. And to repent means to turn back. To repent means to turn back and go back to a past event and, and have done with it and deal with it honestly. And the whole purpose of those teachings is to free your soul so you feel happy about yourself. And just let it go. And once you've done it, by the way, you just let it go. Now, whoa, number eight. The last thing, which is not in this and I'll leave you with, is uh, we'll take a break now. The last thing has to do with what we call the letter. And the letter may be written in your workbook. Please excuse me because I've only been over this about 25 times and 30 years. So if we go through here, uh, releasing your brakes. Okay. Yep. List three people. The last exercise, 42, lists three people you are still angry with who you are now going to forgive completely and what one action are you going to take immediately as a result of what you have learned in this session. And let me just tell you about the letter. And the letter is where you have been through a bad relationship or even worse, a bad marriage. And I've met people 10, 15 years after a bad marriage who are still bitter. And as a result, they never meet anybody else and they end up alone for the rest of their lives because anybody who comes near them is like trying to stroke a porcupine. The first thing that they do is they start to spew all their venom about their bad marriage. And remember, what you dwell upon grows. So the more you think about your bad marriage, the angrier you get, and it just keeps you angry all the time. It's sort of very much like putting hot water onto black tea and letting it steep for a long time. What happens to the water? It gets blacker and blacker and blacker. And the more you dwell on a negative experience, the blacker and blacker your thinking and feeling becomes. So here's how you liberate yourself from a bad relationship. What you do is you write the letter. And the letter has three parts. The letter is, I uh, have thought over our marriage relationship and I forgive you completely for everything that you ever did or said that hurt me in any way. That's the first line. The second line is, to be specific, I forgive you for the following, colon. And you can write down every single thing that you think the person ever did to hurt you. Some people will come up with several pages. The last thing is, I let you go and I wish you well. And then you take the letter and you sign it. And you go down to the mailbox and you mail it. You don't email this, by the way. You have to write it. Psychoneuromotor activity, and you mail it. Now, here's the most astonishing thing. From the time the letter becomes irretrievable, you drop it in the mailbox, and it's gone. Suddenly, all the negativity of the relationship has vanished. It goes. It's almost like a, it's almost like a zapper. As soon as the letter of forgiveness and wishing them well has been mailed, you're free. You're free at last! Free at last! And you walk home, and you walk home singing. It's the most astonishing thing. I've had people come back from all over the world say they couldn't believe it. I had this man in my seminar, and he was sitting there, and he was, and you could see he was having some problems. And he came back. It was a two-day seminar at that time. He came back the next day, and he was smiling, and he was beaming. 
He said, he changed my life yesterday. And he said, let me tell you what happened. Here's what happened. He and his college buddy formed a business. And they built the business for 10 years. And they built it into a multi-million dollar business. And they both got married. And they both had children. And they're both the best of friends. And they worked together. And they built this business. And ho, ho, arm in arm. And they were just really successful. And one day, he went to the office. And his partner was gone. And his partner handled all the money, accounting, bookkeeping. And so he just went to work. Went home that night. His wife was gone. And what he found was that his partner and his wife had been having an affair. They had carefully closed up everything. He had stripped the company bankrupt, and they had both moved away to the other side of the country. And they had carefully written, he'd signed whatever they put in front of him, you know, we just need this for the bank, and he'd signed it. So he ended up on the hook for everything, and they ended up with all the money, and it was legally untouchable. And then they moved away and left basically two families with children and took all the money left him bankrupt with, with I think, two, two or three children. And was this guy entitled to be a little bit angry? I mean, we're talking smoking here. I mean, he was angry, and he was angry. This happened about four years before, and he had to work his buns off for 16 hours a day to save his business. He had to take complete responsibility for his children, and he was just fuming. I mean, his best friend and his wife had stabbed him in the back so deeply, he was entitled to be angry, would you say? He had not done a thing. He had been an innocent player this whole time. But he came to this seminar, and after he went home, he wrote the letter. He wrote the letter to them. He knew their address. He wrote the letter to their address, and he wrote it to, his, to, to both of them and said, I forgive you completely for everything. I forgive you for bankrupting the business and leaving me and blah, 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 and I wish you well. Have a good life. And he dropped the letter. He said, as the letter dropped, it was like the burden had been lifted off of him completely. So sometimes there are things that you can do to unlock that brake on the front wheel of your Mercedes Benz mind and emotion and just release it completely. And a letter is very simple. But forgiveness is the most powerful technique ever discovered to free yourself completely from negative emotions, from all the ones in the past and all the ones to the present and do it on a go forward basis. So there's never anybody that you're angry with. No matter what they do, you are not going to give them the, the honor or the right of being angry with them is when uh, the movie Patton, Patton says in his opening talk, he said, and I don't want to hear any, any calls from the front saying we are holding our position. We are not holding our position. He said, we are not retreating. He said, I don't like to pay for the same ground twice. He said, we are moving ahead. We are going to kill the enemy. We're going to go through him like crap through a goose. Remember that movie, Patton? But he said, we're not, going to pay, we're not going to pay for the same ground twice. My point there is that we're not going to have the injury plus pay for it by being negative and unhappy and angry and frustrated and have it affect our lives and the lives of our family. Pay for it with money, pay for it with lost time, but don't pay for it twice. Just pay for it by saying, okay, it happened. I forgive the person completely and get on with the rest of your life. So I want you to think in your mind, and every time you think of that person, say, I forgive them completely for everything, and I wish them well. And then I, and then I say, God bless them, I wish them well. I've already forgiven them. God bless them, I wish them well. God bless them, I wish her well. God bless them, I wish them well. Whenever the, 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 the thought of the person comes up, I just throw a bucket of water on that negative emotion, and it goes out. And in less than a week, it stops coming up. The fire is out. And you think, geez, I was upset about that for weeks, months, years, and it's gone. Because you cannot wish a person to say, God bless them and wish them well without feeling great about yourself. And if you do that, you become completely liberated. And after lunch, we are going to, that's what we've got here, after lunch, we're going to start talking about programming your mind for success. Now we have cleared your mental decks completely. Now let's build an incredible psychological and emotional edifice or building on it that will now allow you to accomplish anything you want in life. Does anybody have any questions from what we talked about this morning? Co covered a lot, a lot, a lot of ground. My daughter is a psychologist, and uh, I said, I'll, I'll teach you what you learn in five years of a master's program in about five hours. And this is what you learn. I am working on a book now. Uh, the working title is Get Over It and Get On With It. And it basically talks about all the things that we talk about in this seminar and all the different ways that you can just drop off the things that are acting as, a dra as drags on you. 
which is the old negative experiences and negative memories and so on. And wonderfully enough, there are some really great technologies, mental technologies for that, which you're going to start learning after lunch. And so just ways of your thinking differently, because if you change your thinking, you do change your life, and sometimes instantly. You know, a friend of mine was once asked, how long does it take to develop a new habit? And the question is, they say maybe three weeks, uh, four weeks, maybe a month, maybe a, a year. But some habits you can develop instantly. For example, if you sit on a hot stove or put your hand on a hot stove, uh, you'll develop the habit of not putting your hand on a hot stove instantly, and you'll never have to relearn it. <laughs> so for the rest of your life, with one quick experience, you'll have developed a habit of never putting hands on hot stoves. From now on, you'll check the stove before you put your hand on it. There's a little thing in biology where they talk about if a cat sits on a hot stove and burns itself, that cat will never again sit on a hot stove. You'll learn immediately. But the problem is the cat will never sit on a cold stove either. The cat will never sit on any stove, never take another chance at all around stoves. Human beings are often like that. Often we have one negative experience and we say, that's it, and we won't ever try in that area again. And yet you'll find that most people who are successful have failed so many times they've lost track of it. They just try and fail and try and fail and try and fail. And they don't like to fail. Nobody likes to fail. But they recognize that, well, this is part of the experience. You have to make mistakes in order to learn how to be successful. And so the critical thing is don't make a mistake and then never try something else. You just learn from it, pass on, move ahead, especially in relationships, especially in business. I sometimes um, will ask an audience, is there anybody here who's been lied to or let down or cheated or betrayed or swindled or uh, badly done by or treated poorly when they were growing up and had a bad childhood, bad marriage, bad relationship, went broke, lost all your money, everybody like that? And by this time, everybody's got their hand up. I say, well, good, get over it. Let's get on with the rest of your life. You were just shocked, you know. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I've, I've paid a lot for those, that suffering. You can't ask me to just give it up. <laughs> but they think that they have to hold on to it. Like, I, I paid for that, I own that suffering, and you're not going to talk me out of it. <laughs> and you start to think, isn't that amazing? Amazing, like leaning on your hot stove and saying, take your hand off the hot stove. No damn well, no damn way, I'm going to stay here and burn until the skin starts to smolder. Well, why? Well, because I put my hand on this hot stove. And you know the old days where they say, well, if you made a bad marriage, well, you made your bed, you have to lie in it. The idea was that if you made a bad marriage, well, you just stayed in that bad marriage for the rest of your life. I had a woman in my seminar, a very nice woman, attractive woman, but 28. And she came to me at the break, and she'd come by herself. She said her husband, she, she was gone out with him for about two or three years, and they'd been married for two or three years. And she said, um, you know, you're saying that if, 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 if the marriage is not working out or if I'm unhappy, I should think of leaving. Well, I never put those words in people's mouth. I said, well, she said, I've been, but I've got almost six years of my life in this relationship. And, but he's abusive and he's uh, negative and he criticizes me all the time and he runs me down and he drinks. And I mean, it just never what I expected. And she's, as I say, a very nice woman, very smart, attractive. So I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, how long? are you um, intending to live? I said, well, how do you mean? I said, well, you're 28 now. And so let's say you live the lifespan, average lifespan of females in our society, 80 years. How many years is that? 52? Yeah, it's 52 years. So now you have a choice. You can take the five years of, that have gone by, which is the past in your relationship, or you can look at the next 52 years. Do you want to be still in this situation for the rest of your life? She said, oh my God, like OMG, OMG. She said, oh my God, her eyes opened up. And I ran into her about a month later, and she was just shining. I said, how are you doing? She said, great. I said, you dumped the bastard, didn't you? <laughs> she said, I sure did. She said, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life in a negative situation like that. And so the, the, the mark of superior people, the top 10%, is they think about the future most of the time. Is they don't think about the past, because you can't change the past, but you can change the future by changing the present moment. You can change the future by making new decisions today and taking new actions today. It's almost like you've been driving, and no matter how far you've driven, it doesn't matter, but you can change the future by changing the wheel of your mental or emotional mind right now and go in a different direction. 
but you can't change the past. So sometimes people think that they've invested so much in the past. Uh, one of the great obstacles to change is investments of three kinds. One is investments of time. You've invested a lot of time in something and it hasn't worked out and people are reluctant to let it go. Uh, but I say, if you've invested time in something and it hasn't worked out, and it's obviously it's not going to work out, then the question you ask is, if I were not now doing this, knowing what I now know, would I get into it? And this is something we teach in the Total Business Mastery Seminar, called zero-based thinking. If you were not now doing this, knowing what you now know, would you get into it? And I call it a quink analysis, K-W-I-N-K. Knowing what I now know, what would I do? And so I say to managers, if this person applied for their job again today, knowing what you now know, would you hire them? If the answer is no, then how do you get rid of them and how fast? If you would not get into a relationship that you're in today, knowing what you now know, then how do you get out and how fast? Because once I have found a situation fails the quink test, it's finished. It's unsavable. It can never be saved. People keep thinking, well, maybe something will happen, a miracle will happen. I like Peter Drucker's comment. He said that it's not that miracles don't happen, it's just that you can't count on them. And a lot of people think a miracle will happen and save them from all the mistakes that they've made or the time or money they've wasted. So just ask at every part of your life, is there anything that I'm doing today that knowing what I now know, I wouldn't get into? And if the answer is no, then how do you get out and how fast? Going back to investments, the second investment is of money. We invest a lot of money in something and we lose our money. And what many people do is they throw good money after bad. They say, well, I've invested in this stock and it went down, so I'll buy more. Uh, instead of saying, knowing what I now know, would I invest in that stock at all? Would I invest in that business at all? And if the answer is no, how do you get out and how fast? I have a friend who's a professional poker player, goes to Las Vegas and plays in the no hold'em poker, poker rooms. I don't know if you've ever seen those, but they're quite interesting. They've got tables full of professional poker players, and um, they come from all over the place and they play poker all day long, 10, 12, 14 hours. Anyway, his observation was this. He said that once you've made a bet, as far as you're concerned, the money's gone. You don't get it back. You can't say, well, I'm so, I really made a bad bet there, so can I take my money back and give you your cards back? No, that's not how it works. If you get your cards and you make a bet, then you get another card and you make a bet, and then a card comes up and you make a bet and so on, is each time you make a bet, that money's gone forever. So what you do is you make every decision based on the cards that you have now, based on the cards on the table now. This becomes your criteria. And you ask, ask yourself, knowing what I now know, with the cards the way they are now, would I have bet? And if the answer is no, it's time to fold. Know when to hold them and know when to fold them. If you would not bet again, but always remember the money that you've put in is gone money. So in accounting, they have an expression called a sunk cost. Does anybody know what a sunk cost is? Well, a sunk cost is a cost that's gone forever. If you buy a piece of equipment and it's worn out and it's thrown away in the trash, it's a sunk cost. If you run an ad six months ago for your business, it's a sunk cost. It's not a capitalized cost. It's not part of your business. It's gone forever. It's like dropping a, uh, a big uh, anvil off a ship in the middle of the ocean. You can't just go get it back. It's gone. It's, it's called a sunk. That's what they call it, a sunk cost. It's sunk. And it's amazing how many of us try to invest time or money or emotion to preserve a sunk cost or to try to get the sunk cost back, when in reality the time, money, emotion is gone. So the third type of investment is emotion. We put a lot of emotion into something, and it can be a career or a relationship or something else, and at the end of the day, we realize that knowing what I now know is not a good investment. It, the emotion is gone. The investment is gone. So how do you get out and how fast? And here is the great discovery is that when you finally make the decision to end a situation that knowing what you now know you wouldn't have gotten into in the first place, you'll only have one reaction afterwards. And it will be, why did I wait so long? Why did I wait so long to make this decision? Why did I hang in there for so long when I've known it was the wrong situation for such a long time? And so once you've decided you wouldn't get into it, now the only question is how much more are you going to suffer? How much longer? This is purely a personal choice. You could choose, well, I'm going to suffer for another three months or six months or year. Just go ahead, suffer, suffer, suffer. And at the end, you will then fold your cards uh, because it's over. It's over now. You already know it's over in, in most cases. 
where you use a zero-based thinking model, knowing what I now know, there are situations in our life that knowing what we now know we wouldn't get into.